focusing on environmental justice and community-based participatory research, and uh, we've had a wonderful series so far, and we're really happy that Jonathan London has crossed the coast for various reasons, and we'll be spending a couple of days here at Northeastern, and to inaugurate his uh, visit here, he's going to speak on a webinar. He's an assistant professor in human and community development in the Department of Human Ecology at the University of California, Davis. His research addresses conflicts and collaboration in natural resource and environmental issues, with particular emphasis on marginalized rural communities and environmental justice issues in California. He has a BA in environmental studies from Brown University, a master's in city and regional planning, and a PhD in environmental sciences policy and management from UC Berkeley. He's committed to a participatory and collaborative research approach, actively engaging communities in the production of application of knowledge to improve social, economic, political, and environmental conditions. Jonathan directs the UC Davis Center for Regional Change, which serves as a catalyst for multidisciplinary research to inform strategies to build healthy, prosperous, equitable, and sustainable regions. And I really do invite you to please visit their website at UC Davis. They've got a lot of great things going on. Uh, the Center for Regional Change was actually highlighted in a recent article in the journal Environmental Justice that focused on a uh, number of academic-supported research centers that do CBPR, uh, and so I, I think that's also a great article for you to look at. The Superfund Research Program community was in particular very uh, privileged to have Jonathan speak at our last annual meeting. He both gave a talk during the day before the main conference when we had research translation and community engagement course and led a wonderful exercise afterwards that a number of collaborators in the SRP program are now impl in implementing themselves. Uh, it was a, a project in where you had small groups of people, they were given a slip of paper that documented their role in an academic community partnership. They had to discuss it, how far it felt on the continuum of very or not at all community engaged and then go out in the hallway and line up. And then you have like 100 people out in the hall in groups of five, six, seven. And they had to discuss why they lined up in that particular place. And Jonathan led a discussion of that. And you know, people then moved around because they had either overestimated or underestimated where they really belonged. It's a very good learning experience. And for a lot of people who I spoke to there who had a lot of experience in CVPR work, this was actually a very mind-opening thing for them. So I'm very pleased to have Jonathan uh, speak today on our topic, Spinning Community University Partnerships. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Phil. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that that exercise has uh, continued to live on. We've actually done that with a, a, a range of different populations all around the world and all, all ages. So I actually love to hear more about how people are using it. So, so thanks uh, to Phil for this very kind invitation to be part of this presentation and webinar. Um, I'm, I'm going to be sharing uh, work uh, that um, I and uh, a diverse group of colleagues in California have been doing on CBTR, and I'm calling it spinning, and we'll look at that uh, metaphor uh, closely as we, uh, as we go along uh, this journey together. So the roadmap will uh, begin with looking at some definitions and alternative ways of visualizing community university partnerships um, and community engaged research. I'm going to use those somewhat interchangeably, uh, even though there are some distinctions we can get into. Um, and then I'm going to introduce this idea and sort of framework for thinking about um, these kinds of partnerships that I'm calling spinning. Um, I'll give a couple uh, case studies and then end with some uh, suggested lessons that I hope will actually spark conversation of uh, lessons learned for uh, Superfund research programs and other, other scholars and community groups that are involved in these kinds of uh, engaged research. So first I just want to uh, give a little bit of uh, definitions and, uh, and, and history, very, very briefly of course. Um, I, I first want to say that um, while there's a really robust and uh, innovative set of practices uh, in the United States and North America, um, that a lot of this work uh, has really started in the global south and that the U.S. is really catching up to where, um, where efforts in, in other countries have been uh, uh, involved for, for decades. So um, a definition from, uh, from uh, Rajesh uh, Tandon um, really talking about both the um, the research being grounded in people's everyday experiences and useful for addressing their everyday struggles. Um, so that research action key. 
uh, connection. Um, another one of my uh, uh, heroes, John Gaventa, writing based on his participatory research in Appalachia, um, takes this uh, and phrases a similar meaning, um, but talks about uh, creating knowledge and at the same time um, building educational uh, consciousness, uh, you know, critical consciousness in the Frarian sense, uh, and mobilization for action. Okay, so um, as Phil mentioned, I've done a number of different uh, exercises on these continua, and there's a lot of different ways to visualize this, but I like to, to put this as a continuum because uh, there's no right, there's no single right way to do participatory or community-engaged research. I really want to emphasize that what's, what's uh, th the value is aligning whatever kind of approach and methods with the problem at hand, with the capacities that uh, the researchers have and the capacities that the community has. And that, that kind of alignment uh, I, I'm going to return to again and again. But here's, here's one continuum. Actually, I want to say it's a continuum, not the continuum. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, generally from an, an area of, of less participation um, where communities are the objects of study and the researchers are really driving things um, through this sort of middle ground and all the way to where communities are the owners of the research, even though they're doing it with, with, research, with researchers, uh, university or professional researchers of other kinds, um, and, and the professional researchers play more of a facilitative role. Uh, another way to visualize this is, is more uh, in this sort of uh, vertical horizontal axis piece, which creates these uh, four different quadrants. Um, and so on the horizontal axis is the inclusion of community in the types of activities that go on in the research enterprise, from framing the question, designing the methods, implementing analysis, documentation, uh, and application to action. So as you move from uh, left to right, uh, the community is involved in more steps. And then the horizontal axis, sorry, the vertical axis is authority, the decision-making power of communities. Because you can be involved, a community can be involved in a lot of different uh, parts of research, but not necessarily have decision-making power about how that works. So as you go up, the community has more. And, uh, and then that defines these four quadrants um, the, at the low end, the researcher is really driving um, the decisions and doing all the work. Um, at, uh, in the upper right corner, it's, it's that full partnership where communities are fully engaged in all parts and also are playing authoritative roles. And then the, the other two quadrants um, you know, d divide those up. But um, as they say, there's this hazy middle um, because uh, these are sort of idealized types in the four quadrants. But in fact, um, there's this uh, act of uh, improvisation, this kind of uh, call and response, this uh, situational um, approach that generally is kind of where we live. Um, it, it's, it's about, and I'm going to talk more about this, it, it's about being able to deal with the ambiguity and the changeability uh, and the uncertainty uh, in, in this work. That, that's the art of uh, spinning. Um, don't worry about the, all of the small text here, but I, I want to just uh, put out what uh, some colleagues of, uh, of mine in, in a participatory action research uh, graduate fellowship funded by the Ford Foundation put together uh, called the questions that won't go away. Questions that won't go away are Cataguas. And uh, as a good New Englander, I, I of course think about Quahogs, uh, but actually it's Cataguas. Um, uh, we can talk about, the, anyway, yeah. So, so these are the kinds of vexing questions um, that come up when you're, when you're doing this kind of participatory engaged work. Uh, and they range from um, thinking about the community itself. We talk about community engaged, but of course, uh, communities are not monolithic. Um, there's the question of who's in, who's out, what happens if it's a fractured community, who, who and how is it that one is with whom and how are you engaging with complex communities. All communities are, including the one in this room and academic communities too. Um, then there's a question of membership issues. Uh, I was talking with one of my colleagues here about what happens when you're an outsider, what happens when you're an insider in community. How, how does that influence the work that you're doing? 
Um, what, is, what are the roles of the researcher? Um, how can you uh, both um, come to understand the community expectations and how can you actually um, either meet or, or uh, set, help set realistic expectations? There, there's sometimes the idea that, well, we want to do community engage work. So whatever the community wants, that's what we're going to do. But actually, we, we all have, even in groups, um, limitations. We have certain expertise to offer, other areas we might not have to offer. So how do you set realistic expectations? More Katagwas. Um, what's the accountability mechanism? Who, who, is, uh, who, who is accountable to whom? Um, how are the rewards spread um, throughout all of the different entities? How do you negotiate power relationships? Um, and then this last one, sustainability. Um, this is something I'll also uh, return to. Uh, when you're doing this kind of work, generally it's uh, looking at complex issues that are uh, decades longer in the making. Um, so coming in and doing what some people call drive-by research, it, just, it, it, it doesn't fit, obviously. It needs to have this sort of sustained approach. So how do we do that when, say, we're uh, master's students coming through a two-year program or even a doctoral student in a five, six, seven, eight-year program? Hopefully not that one. Um, uh, and even the professors, you know, we, we come and go. We, have different kinds of research priorities. How do we how do we sustain this? Okay, so at this point you're a little bit uh, anxious. Uh, if you haven't done so much of this work, you may be thinking, well, well, what am I getting myself into? Is this something I really want to take on? And even if uh, you've done this work, and I know a number of people in the room have done it far longer than I have, um, you know, you may be thinking, hmm, you know, is there, are these things that maybe I haven't addressed enough, or maybe I want to think more about it? Um, so that's okay. Uh, I want I want to have that kind of little bit of creative tension here in the room. And, uh, um, and, and so one way to hold and work with that tension um, is to have these sort of generative metaphors. So I'm going gonna, um, gonna to lay one out. Um, and I, it's based on the idea of, of spinning. So I didn't know so much about spinning before I played with this idea. Maybe there are people in the audience who know a lot more about it. But basically, you have these fibers and they're twisted into yarns, and the yarns are twisted into strands, and the strands are twisted into cables, which then form um, fabric. All right, well, we're not in a knitting class, you're saying. Right, so uh, what do I, why, am I, why am I showing you this? Uh, so let's fill this out now from the, from the point of view of community-engaged research. So the fibers are all of us individually, individual researchers, individual residents, leaders of community organizations. We come together in, in, in organizations, in institutions, research centers, departments, uh, advocacy organizations, uh, neighborhood associations. So these individual fibers are then bound together in organizations, and then the organizations then come together in these strands. And I'm going to talk about these three kinds of strands, knowledge, resources, and authority. And uh, as I say, I'll go into each of those. Um, those then are bound together into these partnerships, and the partnerships are then woven into this fabric, um, and the, the goals or the purpose of weaving that kind of fabric is both discovery and building of academic knowledge or broad, broader knowledge, and public benefit and public action. So there's this flow, this weaving kind of flow. So let's look at um, these specific strands. Let's go into a little bit more detail. Knowledge, resource, and authority. So knowledge. Um, there are many different kinds, and it's important to not get bound into one or another. So there's theoretical knowledge that one learns from reading theory and kind of thinking it through and um, work, working it out, uh, debating, and so on. Um, there's empirical knowledge based on the experiments and field, field research, measuring things and um, talking to people and so on. Um, there's experiential knowledge that's based on everyday life, you know, li living uh, next to a freeway or wherever it is you live. What, what is it that you encounter in your everyday life? Um, what have you learned from those experiences? And then cultural knowledge, collective knowledge, the values, the identities, meanings, histories 
Um, those are all valuable sources of knowledge that can be brought into these community-engaged partnerships. Resources. Uh, there's the obvious one of money, um, the funding to do this kind of work, to pay yourself, perhaps, your grad students, to provide um, for community members. Uh, there's also personnel, the, the human capital um, that you have in your group or, and also the, um, the human capital with the community members that you're working with. Uh, equipment, sometimes, uh, you know, as a social scientist, my main equipment is a, a p pencil and a pad of paper uh, and a recorder. But, uh, you know, people doing um, lead testing in the soil, $40,000, you know, uh, soil, uh, soil lead tester, uh, et cetera, air quality monitors, so on. It's, uh, it's not cheap, uh, and it's a, it's a valuable resource. And then finally, authority. That's, that is also a key strand. So that's both on, so even if, and as I was showing before, there's researchers making decisions, are they seen as legitimate? Um, uh, by a range of partners. Are they, is, if you're doing this community-engaged research, is it seen as legitimate by your uh, dissertation advisor, by your tenure committee, uh, by the journal that you're trying to publish in, by community organizations? Uh, you may come in with all sorts of credentials and expertise and show up at a community meeting and who, who are you? What, why are you here? What, what, what makes you think that just because you have all those degrees after your name, you actually have something to teach us? But you better sit down and listen to us. So there's that kind of issue of legitimacy, accountability. What, what are the mechanisms that and to whom are you accountable? Um, and then are, is there the ability to resolve conflicts? There needs to be some kind of level of authority to bring these different kinds of entities together. So it's wrapping these up. So uh, a couple things to, uh, to think about with these strands, and I've mentioned this a little bit already, um, first of all, that all partners in these kinds of partnerships have valuable assets to bring. Uh, and uh, very often, you know, the standard, there's certain, certain ideas about what's valued and what's not. But the argument I'm making is that all of these need to be valued and lifted. Sometimes they're not even visible, a strand that's not even seen, um, and needs to be lifted up. <coughs> uh, and that all partners need to... Uh, be able to bring, um, be, be able to bring their assets in. Um, so a, a couple more insights about uh, why spinning. Why am I using that? So first of all, uh, to be able to do that kind of binding, yeah, you, you literally need tension. If you don't have tension in the threads, it, it, it's sort of floppy all over the place. There's there's no cohesion. There's no community building. There's no um, uh, identity and so on. So you literally need tension in the in the strand. Um, but also, this is complex and political work. You're dealing with power, after all. Uh, so you're in a field of power. Power is always about push and pull and tension and and uh, and conflict and domination and resistance. That's the stuff we're studying out there. Um, and that also inevitably comes into our own work. I mean, we experience those things. And if, you, if you're not, I, I want to learn about that. Maybe you figure something out that I don't know. Um, but I would, I would suggest to you that if, even if you're not noticing it, that there are tensions that and, and, and useful to look at them. To also have strong, uh, strong uh, spinning and strong cables and so on, um, it's dependent on the strength of, of each individual fiber, each individual yarn, um, and that when there's imbalance, say if there's lots of resources in the university and not very much resources in the community, that's a significant imbalance. Or if there's uh, you know, a significant uh, authority in one party, not so much in another, or they're in conflict with each other, that sort of throws off the weave. Uh, and uh, and so uh, when that sort of thing is happening, uh, breakage or fraying, it's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, but it's not unfixable. And in fact, um, beautiful and high-quality fabrics are, uh, are that way because of these sort of adaptive 
uh, creative responses to these kinds of tensions. It actually makes for a better partnership, makes for a more sustained partnership. You, and think about this even in our individual relationships, right? I mean, I'm not going to get too into kind of therapy here. But, you know, as you grow in relationship, the fact that you can fight it out sometimes and then find out that you can recover and you can you learn something about yourself, you learn something about the other, um, that happens in groups. Uh, in classrooms and so on. It also happens in community processes. Um, so the message is don't shy away from the tension. Don't, don't worry about if there's breakage. W worry about how you're going to fix it, but not the fact that it happened. Um, and it's, again, that's the, that's the art. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's sort of the conceptual framework. So now I want to uh, give a couple of examples to, uh, to ground this, uh, this kind of conceptual work in uh, a little bit more uh, detail. So um, one partnership, and a few of you in the room are familiar with this, uh, that, that we've been involved with, uh, at our, our group in the Center for Regional Change and, and others, has been uh, three years, I say plus, it's three years in growing, it just keeps going on and on. Um, between our group and environmental justice and health advocates in, in the San Joaquin Valley, and for those who don't know that, it's, it's at the once the richest agricultural land in the world, arguably, and it's the greatest concentration of, of poverty. It has some of the worst air quality in the nation, um, contaminated drown, groundwater, heavy pesticide applications, substandard housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is a tough, this is a tough neighborhood to grow up in. Um, so we've been working with advocates who are work, who are dealing with all those, all those issues, and they asked us to um, to work with them to help document uh, and and analyze and document the kind of things that they pretty much knew, um, the, the multiple cumulative impacts on them. But they they wanted to both understand it better for themselves, kind of check. You know, what's what we experience is that play out um, on a regional scale, and also to be able to share that kind of information in, in authoritative ways with public agencies, with funders, and so on. So it's not just anecdotal, even though anecdotes are, are important data as well. Um, so then our response was uh, to use uh, GIS, Geographic Information System, digital and online mapping to, uh, to lay out those kinds of patterns. Um, and uh, and then the advocates have taken that. Well, I'll show you some of the impact. But one of their initial um, sort of motivations for doing this project was to do the analysis themselves, but also to push state and federal agencies to use these kinds of cumulative impacts um, methodologies uh, themselves. So over the, let's say, a course of, uh, of three plus years, um, we we built this relationship. So the first year was a lot of trust building. I mean, I, I, myself and a number of us had relationships, pre-existing uh, partnerships in the community. But um, but as a as a whole, there was a lot of you know university community trust building, a lot of capacity building. Both of them schooling us about realities in the in the region and our group sharing different mapping um, methodologies, really to the literacy, map literacy, um, not to be taken for granted. So that was a lot of iterative back and forth, us sharing uh, approaches and critiquing them and saying, no, we want it this way, back and forth, or what do you mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then uh, eventually that culminated in a report, Land of Risk, Land of Opportunity, uh, that documented, and I'll show you a little more of the detail in a second, documented these cumulative impacts. Um, and, then, and then the partners, took it and ran with it. And when I say plus, uh, three plus years, um, the plus is not so much us doing analysis. We, we've done the report. We're, we're doing other work um, related. But at this point, it's really literally in their hands. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what they're doing with it in their hands. Uh, so this is the analysis. And this is not a methodology talk, but just to give you a visual of, of what we did. So we basically looked at environmental hazards in a, in a cumulative sense, air quality, um, pesticides, toxic release, um, facilities, uh, 
other, other factors, as well as social vulnerability, so issues like uh, income and linguistic fluency, and, uh, racial segregation, uh, uh, formal education, and so on. And then looked about how those mapped on together and tried to highlight the places that had uh, the, the highest degrees, both of environmental hazards present and social vulnerability, creating um, this kind of risk, land of risk. Uh, so, and again, I, if there are questions about it, I'm happy to talk more about the methodology. Uh, so one, one of the methods uh, beyond this GIS socio-spatial mapping, we did uh, participatory community-based mapping. Um, so in this case, uh, over, I think there are six or seven of those, of these workshops that are our regional um, partners, environmental justice, environmental health organizations that really had the grassroots connections and expertise, which, which we didn't, and we weren't going to build that in a year. These are you know, decades uh, in the making. So they, they worked with community, grassroots community groups, um, shared the kind of maps we had created, and then created their own maps of uh, what our colleague Jim Sad at Occidental calls hidden hazards, places that don't show up in the secondary data um, or that show up but you don't know who really lives near them or how people interact with it. So the, the communities um, in these workshops created their own maps. We then took those data, um, mapped them, and put them over different kind of base maps. So this is the uh, in West Fresno, one of the major metro centers in the valley, the, the hazards that community members identified as well as assets and mapped over um, uh, sort of racial concentrations. Then, here comes the exciting part, uh, the activists then took that and uh, brought it into their advocacy work. So this is our map, and this is, uh, for those of you on the, on the uh, webinar, you can't see this, but um, the African-American woman in the glasses in the front, Mary Curry, who had been working for literally decades to try to close down this noxious uh, rendering plant in her neighborhood so bad that you can't go outside in the summer. Um, it's still not shut down, but they've taken a huge progress using these kinds of maps as well as very uh, skillful, sophisticated legal advocacy that, that other organizations are doing. Um, and we're not in this picture. <clears throat> so I, I sometimes talk about uh, that I like to identify a clear line between research and advocacy because I want to get up as close as I can to it. And then I want to hand things over the line to the advocates, and they take it and run with it. So not a university protest, but they're using the kinds of knowledge products that we, that we developed together. So some of, the, um, some of these strands, these knowledge, uh, resource, and authority strands. Um, so we brought in our kinds of socio-spatial and methodological knowledge. They brought in their deep community experiential and collective cultural knowledge. Um, and we, we did community, uh, rather we did mutual capacity building uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, we brought in our uh, funding resources. Um, they actually brought in their funding resources and, and were uh, there. Uh, a number of the groups are, are really good at this, so they ended up with as much funding and perhaps even more than, than we did, which was perfectly fine. Um, we committed to, in a, in a, man, mem, a memorandum of understanding, um, that we would have transparent funding. Um, we wouldn't be going uh, for a grant that could uh, compete with them, and we'd tell them for what, what we were going for. Um, we made sure that whatever grants we had, there was funds going to community organizations, um, and we ended up actually co-funding the, the final product. The authority, uh, this, was, this was where there was these creative tensions, which I think actually strengthened the partnership. Um, so as I say, there was some important trust building, and we needed co-authority. Um, the community groups uh, pushed for, and we very... Um, very much uh, we're happy to uh, engage with them to create this memorandum of understanding. So there was this co-accountability where we said what we're responsible for, they said what they're responsible for, how we were going to interact with each other. Um, one of the things that's, that we agreed that we would have control of the secondary data-based maps, they would have control of the uh, primary community-based data maps. We could share them but only with uh, mutual agreement. Uh, and that they were making all of the decisions about the policy advocacy um, applications. That was not, not our place. 
So some of the, uh, they call the spinning saga, some of the challenges and the responses. Um, so we had actually brought in resources to start, um, which was good because we could start going. On the other hand, some of the partners were um, somewhat concerned that, well, you've got this money and you haven't talked with, with us yet. Um, we had got the money in general to work with community groups um, and we're looking for places to, to work with, but we had, we had to deal with some of that upfront tension. Um, over time, our uh, group's close affiliation with the advocates made it somewhat more difficult for us to engage with policymakers because because we were, you know, they were concerned that how much of this is this independent research and how much is this advocacy. And we we dealt with this by having really rigorous and very transparent methods and put that into all the reports for people to access. Um, uh, one of our uh, part, one of our university partners was a really skilled facilitator. She ended up doing some early facilitation. I put a question mark about the requirement. There's pros and cons to that kind of role, um, which is case specific. So, uh, so I kind of already did this. So the response to uh, these kinds of uh, funding tensions, we created this MOU. We created this uh, rigorous methodology, um, and we had um, we had this decision making plan. So some of the outcomes, there was uh, strengthened uh, relationships. Um, the advocates now have gone on and playing really active roles in statewide and, and national um, policies on cumulative impacts. Um, the state and also uh, federal level are using, not, not necessarily our methodology, but have drawn in some of our methods. Um, and there's uh, increased uh, attention to environmental justice in the San Joaquin Valley. All right, I'm, I've taken a little bit longer than I meant to do, so I'm going to unfortunately have to do this one uh, more quickly. Uh, so another partnership is focused on uh, a, a project looking at soil lead in home gardens and um, how community groups are sort of navigating these trade-offs in um, ecosystem services uh, between you know, the benefit of having gardens and potential risk of soil lead. And we've uh, We've been uh, working with uh, a nonprofit partner that I'll, I'll describe. Uh, so the partner is called Ubuntu Green. Um, I'll give you a little description of those in a second. They've been putting these home gardens and doing community organizing around health. Um, our team, uh, a set of, um, not our Center for Regional Change, but uh, uh, faculty working in Mary Cadenasso's lab, who's a urban ecosystem ecologist, have been doing lead testing. Um, a team that involves uh, uh, researchers from a number of institutions. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, actually. So this is our a community partner, Ubuntu Green. This word comes from um, Bantu language, talking about the necessity of shared shared work um, and shared benefit. Um, so some of the uh, the CRAs here. So the some of the values are, on knowledge are that it was uh, a multidisciplinary team from social science and biophysical science. Um, the community organization brought their cultural capital and political capital, um, and we used a variety of different kinds of methods from, you know, um, XRF soil lead testing to uh, ethnographic work to participatory work using uh, community videos. Um, we shared resources um, and some some of the uh, some of the budget actually for the garden builds that we needed as test sites. The university was able to use some of its resources to support, um, and we des we designed sort of uh, participatory or rather uh, mutual uh, decision making. So some of the uh, say the the sagas. So um, there was some confusion uh, uh, originally about how much. Uh, funding the community partner had for these gardens and how many gardens there were going to be. Um, that that kind of threw off the sampling frame. Um, I'll go through these quickly. Um, there was also, because of this participatory role on the video, which was both a research tool and a resident engagement tool, uh, we had to figure out how, how both of those values could be held. Um, and uh, so we we did this sort of flexible uh, use of the resources to support some of the garden builds. Um, we did a lot of open and continuing dialogue about these roles and responsibilities. Um, and when we were working with the university, which was in some ways harder than the community group, issues of liability, 
uh, and so on about going onto people's um, properties. We had to do a, lo a lot of a lot of negotiation with our university council and so on just to be able to do this participatory work. Um, so that that's a whole other topic. Okay, so hopefully now this spinning schema makes sense. So I want to uh, I want to close with some lessons for uh, Superfund research programs and other community engaged research. So first off, as I said, the alignment of the engagement method with the capacities and the realities on the ground is crucial. So to think about first starting with an assessment, before you go into starting to design the research, just what, what's in the room? Who, who's in the room? What are the resources, the concerns, the issues that they have? Um, how are we going to de design a shared authority system? Um, again, this alignment and uh, it, you know, while you have this initial assessment, ideally what you're also designing is this ongoing iterative learning loop. You don't feel like you need to know everything to start, even though that's what we're kind of, uh, our occupational identity is, we're the experts. So we should know everything to start. Well, we don't. And it's not, you're not going to know it until you're kind of into it. And so how do you build in that learning? And communities too, who validate community knowledge, absolutely. But they're learning, they're learning along with us. Um, we shouldn't assume that they have everything they need to know um, in the get-go. Uh, investing in relationships take time, but as we say, if you can build slow, start slow, you can go fast later. And if you don't put in that upfront relationship building, you're going to be mired in the conflict and mired in the, in the you know, back and forth, uh, and, and it may not even work. So, that's an, that's an investment, that's a gift that's going to keep giving. Consider an MOU. You don't need it in all situations. We found it to be really useful to really spell things out, again, for mutual accountability. Don't fear tension, as I said, but focus on creative repair. Uh, whoops. No, that's it. Those are the lessons. So I want to, uh, th this is in the slides, um, but a number of these pieces are, are documented. At this point, because the soil ed is ongoing, we haven't written that up yet, but the San Joaquin project has been written up in a couple of different settings, and I, I want to acknowledge our, our funding partners, our university partners, and our, uh, our community partners. Uh, so, thank you very much, and uh, I understand there's a whole process for uh, questions and response, so I will uh, love to hear how those work. Is that right? Sure. Is so first, do we have any questions from folks here in the room at Northeastern? Uh, yes. So I have a question regarding um, authorship yeah. for the papers. And so, I mean, using a personal experience, I'm in the middle of a paper that's about a CBPR project, and I have people, I can identify people who participate in the project to be co-authors, but how do I... You know, if I'm selecting three to four out of the whole group, yeah. how do I deal with that? And then I guess I'm just asking, quite, you know, any information regarding how to deal with mm. that level of transparency and involvement. I realize I forgot to repeat oh. the question in case people couldn't hear, oh, but the okay. question was about authorship. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great question, and uh, this is probably going to be my answer to many things. Uh, it depends. Um, so what does it depend on? One is, you know, what... Um, what's the kind of publication that you're doing? What is, what's the kind of writing um, that's necessary that will influence, you know, who, who, who will be a good partner? And that goes for, you know, working with grad students and so on. You want to make sure people are aligned. Um, being transparent, uh, I mean, it may make sense, and you know the situation, obviously, but it may make sense to put the invitation out there and say, like, here's, here's what I need, here's the expectations, the time, you know, et cetera, uh, who's, who's interested. And, you know, I don't know, maybe you'll have 50 people and then you'll have to work on that. I imagine it'll be a fair bit less. There's also different roles, of course. You know, there's the actual co-authoring, like writing sections. Uh, there's editing. Uh, and then there's just sort of uh, more broad, you know, input and, and sort of being able to find the, the right kinds of venues for, uh, to, to include people in, in one of those, uh, you know, one, one of those kinds of opportunities. So, um, yeah, so I would say assess the, assess the situation and try to create multiple uh, engagement opportunities. Yeah. So I've never seen string theory applied to uh, <laughs> community <laughs> yeah, research. String theory, right. I think we may put some grants up for some businesses to 
There you go. But, um, I, I like it. I, I assume all the strands are organic fibers. But, um, yeah, yeah. The a couple things come to mind. One is that, and I've been dealing a lot of this with dealing with community-based participatory research in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And communities are highly fractured. Yeah. Particularly some of the worst environmental justices occur in communities that are deeply fragmented. You might have a community that is homogeneous, so therefore they can present a united front. But in communities where there's a lot of churning, where there's a lot of demographic transitions, you have community highly fractured by different ethnicities, races, peoples of origin, languages, cultures. Mm -hmm. It makes it much more easy to target those types of communities because they cannot present a united front. Right. But it means that the notion of community is such a precarious mm -hmm. term mm -hmm. because it's really many communities wrapped up in one, and there might be very compete, very profound differences in vision about what would constitute an ideal community. That's leaving aside the different types of power relations. Mm -hmm. um, that often you have to navigate. But often different communities uh, or different components of what you might consider an environmental justice community often have very different mm. positions. And so um, part of that is negotiating those differences when there isn't this type of homogeneous community or right. unified vision, even within an environmental justice mm -hmm. organization. And then this notion also that the community we really can't consider that an abstraction from its relationship to other communities. Yeah. Because often the goals of certain communities might be to protect their community, irrespective of neighboring communities. So if we keep out the offending facility, then is it going to be relocated mm -hmm. in a community next door? Yeah. And so this notion then, too, of community in isolation from neighboring communities, yeah. that it might be part of a larger community mm -hmm. instead of state. So briefly to repeat the question, two parts, uh, what about communities that are fractured that have differences within them, and secondarily, what about communities who uh, have their own needs but that might affect the uh, uh, other communities around them? Yeah, that's a fan fantastic question and, 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 and observation as well. Um, so I'd say a, a couple things about it. Uh, one is that, um, well, w one is just to ground the, the examples that we've that I gave, um, we we worked with um, diverse uh, communities or community organizations working over uh, a wide uh, regional scale, but who actually had a fair bit of cohesion. And our San Joaquin Valley partners had been part of a number of different coalitions, uh, which is kind of an interesting topic in itself, how different social movements sort of weave themselves together. Uh, but that was a huge asset that they brought, was that kind of social movement experience um, uh, and, and, and allowed us to kind of move much faster. If, if we had been in a more fractious situation, I, I would say um, the, the response that, that I would have is one is to do an assessment up front and see how, how amenable is this to building some sort of cohesive group that you could work with, some sort of partnership. And if not, you know that may be that that may call for not a broader community engagement. It may be you know a, a single partnership with with one organization, um, or or maybe not to do an engaged process. Maybe it's to do research and provide that information, and maybe that can even help you know bring some more cohesion. Um, this issue of um, you know communities divided against each other, I think, is a, a really important one, and. Yeah, as being in community regional development, sort of looking at the politics of community is is, is crucial. So one of also the benefits of our San Joaquin project is that it, it was regional. So it really was focused on these uh, uh, you know inequitable patterns um, with with you know dozens and dozens of communities in a larger regional context. If it was you know just within one place, I think that also you know would have would have been more difficult. So. Um, I, yeah, so as in short, uh, it can be done, but um, you kind of need, need to be realistic. And there's some, some context in which it's just not appropriate at, at a given time. So that's, that's really important. We have questions from listeners outside the room. I don't see any right now, but um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself right now and ask where you can click the raise hand button and I can call on you. We'll just give you a second to do that before we call someone oh, yeah, else yeah, in the room. Please. Yeah. Ask one more question. 
one more question that may be a little bit similar to this, and that is, what if a community group presents themselves as representing the majority or the group? Right. How do you assess the credibility or the the support for that group or pair of groups or three groups mm -hmm. when in fact it, it really doesn't have the community support, but it just happens that they have grabbed the power to yeah. start that process? question was, what if a group claims to represent the whole community but really doesn't? How does the academic partner and the other partners uh, make an assessment of that? Uh, again, f a ter terrific question. And I, I'll answer that in a, in, a, in a couple ways. So first is, for those who are doing sort of, you know, biophysical, uh, you know, more toxicological, epidemiological research who aren't necessarily social scientists, consider getting a social scientist on your team. So that, that's what we study, right, is, is sort of those power structures and conflict and collaboration dynamics. Not to say that we're going to figure it all out, but that really is a, is a call for this sort of multidisciplinary approach. Um, you know, I think also um, just having, and this is hard sort of in these sort of grant-funded timelines, but if you, if you can have time um, up front before you've got to launch into your um, method, um, that's ideal, and to make use of uh, sort of the historical and, uh, you know, uh, local knowledge of, of a variety of partners to, to suss out uh, the situation. And that can even be, you know, you can even make that into uh, a part of the research methodology. I mean, to do a power analysis. Uh, for example, uh, which could be a really valuable par part of the research itself, um, but can also set you up uh, to be able to design, you know, design an appropriate approach. Any questions from folks outside? Oh, we still don't have any questions on All right, so I have a question I've been holding off. Uh, what about the role of the university in supporting these kinds of partnerships? They have to make a commitment that maybe goes beyond, well, if you get the grant, we'll take it and let you do this. But right. how do you uh, get universities to do this? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I guess there's a, a couple context-specific uh, kinds of points here. First, uh, we, we do, uh, I and my group, do have the benefit of being in a, a land-grant institution. Uh, at, University of California. So we have this public mission, and there's actually obligations that we have to do, you know, to to do public benefit research, uh, even if that's this sort of more edge towards advocacy kind of research isn't what most people have in mind. Um, I I trot out the land grant mission as often as I can, <laughs> uh, as a shield, as a, a banner, uh, going in. Um, uh, I mean, there, well, again, just thinking about UC Davis, uh, there's uh, a, a number of us, and, and this is certainly in other campuses too, uh, but where researchers who are doing this kind of community-engaged work are, are coming together and developing a platform, um, working with the administration to get some additional support um, to, uh, to be able to lift this up um, in you know, in university communications, uh, kind of make, help help universities sort of make it part of their brand, and that, that's a bit of a double-edged sword because once once it starts getting sort of bright and shiny, uh, you know, and, and and attractive in some ways, the administration then then you kind of know you're <laughs> you may actually be straying further away from where you want to go, um, but I I do think that. Um, Coming together as groups, not just as, as individual researchers, um, to, to say to administration, to your departments, to your colleges, hey, this, this is something we value. Um, I would say, uh, you know, looking across campuses, I mean, so, something that, uh, well, even coming here today, um, I'm, I'm telling, uh, you know, my colleagues in administration at UC Davis, hey, look at what Northeastern's doing. You know, they have this whole group. And, uh, and you know, isn't this something that that you, you might want to do as well? This this is you know a, a kind of a prestigious institution, and they're making these commitments. So you know, we should we should be able to do that kind of thing as well. And I think the other part is um, the the leverage of of national funding agencies. You know, uh, National Institute of Environmental Health is certainly made, and NIH making strong commitments on community engagement. There are these community engagement cores that 
still runs here and probably many of you in the room are part of. Um, so being able to leverage that and saying to the university, calling someone, hey, this, the, if you want to get these kind of grants, um, these are important methods. These are important approaches. It's not just this sort of idiosyncratic thing that you know, a couple wacky professors are doing. It, this, is, this is mainstream. This, this is something that actually can leverage resources. All right, we have time for just one more. Uh, another question that's, I think, terribly important is around popular discourse and public access to the research. Yeah. Uh, and I've run into this, even doing climate justice research in the Pacific Islands. Mm. Excellent studies put together, but they're put in books that cost $120 to buy, yeah. and, or they're in journals that the public doesn't have access to, and often they're written in a style that are inaccessible. Right. So I wanted to say a few words, too, about certain models about making research accessible and therefore usable mm -hmm. in the community. So the question is, how do we make research accessible when books are expensive and journals often inaccessible? Yeah, so uh, that, that is, that is uh, clearly a challenge, uh, and not just in this community-engaged work, but just in, in general, a sort of privatization of, of knowledge. Uh, so a, a couple approaches there. What, one is um, to, well, my colleague and uh, colleague of a number of people here in the room, Manuel Pastor, um, typically say, you know, when I do, I won't put myself in his voice, when he does research, he thinks about uh, three things. He thinks about the, um, you know, the journal, peer-reviewed journal, um, the, uh, you know, the sort of more professional uh, trade kind of uh, publication, access, free access, and the op-ed piece. Um, so di different different modes of, of getting things out there. You know, I, I try to publish in, in open access journals, on online journals, or, you know, if there's a journal that has an, an open access opportunity, you know, it costs several thousand dollars, I try to make, make that possible. Um, you know, we do these reports uh, based, again, that we also publish in peer-reviewed uh, venues, but that are, are, are written in more accessible forms. Um, and then tr try to do like a lot of uh, conferences, uh, presentations, and uh, uh, as much as we can, doing that with our community partners. You know, so they're they're getting access to th that th those kinds of public uh, exposure opportunities as well. So, um, yeah. So there, there's a, the sort of the longer, tougher fight of, of pushing against that sort of privatization of knowledge. That I think we we all need to be engaged with. Um, and then there's also sort of finding these multiple venues, multiple outlets. Well, I'd like to thank Jonathan London for his wonderful talk and for the exciting conversation we've been able to have about that. Uh, I do hope that you'll visit the website for the Sense for Regional Change. And I realize I forgot to say that Jonathan is now working with the Superfund Research Program at UC Davis. So he really is in our family in lots of ways. Uh, so we thank him very much. And I, I want to briefly have Tom Sheen come up and tell us about the next webinar. Tom's head of our training court here at Protect. Superfund Research Program at Northeastern. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I, I also want to thank Jonathan for a terrific uh, contribution to the webinar series this year, which has been focused on uh, community engagement uh, aspects of our work. Uh, there will be one final webinar. Uh, it is currently scheduled for April 7th, and we're confirming the speaker for that now. And that will complete the webinar series for this academic year. So I will have more on that as we go forward, and I'll, I'll uh, send out, or Kristen will send out an announcement about <laughs> that uh, shortly. And again, thanks to uh, Jonathan for a terrific contribution to this series, and we'll look forward to having you back on April 7th for that final webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much.